Alright, I want you to look at the screen and I want you to see the list of words and think of who you visualize in your head when you see these words. Who do you associate with these words? Then do the same thing for this other set of words because this list, this list is actually very important. Currently, there's a lot of conversations concerning sexual assault and abuse among females. And while that is extremely important and it raises a lot of awareness, what happens is we've somehow kind of normalized the idea of sexual assault and abuse only happening to females. And then when we do that, we subtly and unintentionally block out the very vulnerable population, which is males. So how do we define sexual abuse? So sexual abuse is when someone in a position of power and authority takes advantage of a person's trust and respect to involve them in sexual intent. And this is extremely important to understand because this previous summer I was in Nairobi working for an NGO. And what I was doing was I was going through programs and, and doing data analysis concerning sexual assault and abuse reporting for females. And as I was going through this data, what I consistently noticed was the lack of data for reporting for males. And so I began to ask myself questions. Does this mean that males just aren't victims of sexual assault and abuse? Or maybe it's just not happening here. And so what I began to do is I, I poured through global statistics and I went through and what I saw was an alarming trend. Just the complete lack of data in reporting for males who are victims of sexual assault and abuse. So looking at the World Health <clears throat> Violence, World, the World uh, Report on Violence and Health from the WHO, they have statistics. And there's two things you want to note about that. Is one, the majority of victims will actually be female. And that has a lot to do with social, social and cultural um, ideas worldwide. But two, you have to also understand that for both males and females, the reporting practices are seriously underreported for data collection. Now, UNICEF. UNICEF said that sexual abuse and violence against males is a, is a significant problem. And 15 million females aged 15 to 19 years of age in a national survey came out and reported that they had been victims but UNICEF said they did not have a global estimate for any males worldwide. So I went to our own CDC and I looked at their fact sheet. And so what it has is, it has, from a national survey, you have males and females who reported abuse. And so 37% of females said that they were first a victim of sexual violence or abuse between the ages of 18 and 24. But there were no data for men. Then 30% that it happened between the ages of 11 and 17. Still, no data for men. And then you look at 12% of females said it happened to them when they were of age 10 years or younger. But then when you look at the data for the males, it's nearly twice the amount. So when we look at this data, what are we, what are we asking ourselves? What are we saying? So are we saying that after the young males become 11 to 17, the abuse just stops? Or they're no longer victims? No. What is happening is, they're coming out and they're reporting once they are grown men. We're talking 10, 20, 30 years after the abuse has happened. And that's a problem. <clears throat> so what we need to ask ourselves is, how have we normalized this idea of sexual abuse and sexual assault being only a female issue? And why are the men not coming out and speaking of earlier when it happens? So we have several contributing factors. One is the idea of masculinity. And we put this out socially at a very early age. We use phrases like, toughen up, stop acting like a girl, act like a man. And if you look at how we even interact with our children, take two children on a playground. They both fall, scrape their leg, they're bleeding, they both feel pain. But what happens is when the little girl runs up and crying, we embrace her. We talk to her about her pain. We allow her to cry. But when the little boy runs up, 
We brush him off, we tell him to be tough, we clear away his tears, and we tell him, be a big boy, go play. And it's really important to give males the opportunity to express their emotions, especially when being victimized. We allow our girls to display the sensitivity, but suddenly in those moments, we've somehow closed off a conversation with our males, and we've told them it's no longer masculine to be emotional or to discuss your pain or share your vulnerabilities. All victims may feel embarrassed and ashamed, but males feel that shame, especially once they've become the victim, and then again because they feel like one. And this kind of goes against all of that masculine mindset that we've socially already established. <coughs> It is the idea of masculinity that's really important because it's perpetrators and predators who first exploit that idea of masculinity. We teach our children to blindly follow directions, and we tell them that they have to listen to those that are in power and authority, and then we as parents and caregivers trust and respect that our children will be cared for. Perpetrators know especially that many males don't want to be associated with being a victim or weakness or emotional, and they play on that. They may threaten them with how they're going to be viewed if they talk about what has happened to their peers and their loved ones. They may even threaten their social, sexual orientation. So it's the stigma and the idea of weakness and vulnerability and shame that's associated with being a sexual assault and sexual abuse victim that further keeps these males silent victims. Many of the other perpetrators also place themselves in positions in which they know they're going to be engaging with children, especially males. All right, they put them in position of roles like teachers, coaches, religious affiliates. They are family friends. They might be your loved ones. They might even be your own peer. All right, an example is how we, inter we interact with these roles every day. Coaches and players smack each other on the bottom and say, good game. We take our kids to the doctor, and we let the doctor examine their naked bodies. Teens and boys, they'll wrestle with each other. And these are all normal behaviors, normally and accepted behaviors. But perpetrators and predators, they twist that. They blur the lines. And what they do is they prey on these victims, and they distort and it makes it hard for the victim to differentiate between what was the acceptable and normal behavior for what is now unacceptable. They allow their victims to gain their trust and they make it confusing. And the goal is not to make children or teens like afraid or suspicious or fearful of adults, but we have to be extremely transparent with them and we can't send them with blinders on out into the world. And so it's really important to have what I call uncomfortable conversations. And these uncomfortable conversations, I've been told from parents and friends, come when we have to talk to our children about their own bodies. And I know some of the common conversations are stranger danger, or bad touch, good touch. And a lot of people leave out secret touch, where that's when the perpetrator or predator is telling the child, the teen, even the young adult, to keep conversations and occurrences secret. And that should be a red flag, but if you're having to keep something secret, that's not okay. And it's these comfortable conversations in which we need to change the masculine mindset to not be associating victims with weakness. What we need to tell our males is that it takes a lot of strength and courage and bravery to come out and speak out when these things have happened. And we need to tell them that when you stand up to a per perpetrator or a predator in your life, you're not just protecting yourself, but you're stopping the victimization of others, and that is heroic. So that the only person that needs to be associated with shame and weakness needs to be the perpetrator or the predator themselves. And so how do we do this? One, we have to disassociate these victim ideas, and we can't make it all about females. We have to make it extremely inclusive, and we have to change our vocabulary to make it okay that males don't want to be silent victims, that they understand that strength and character is standing up and advocating for yourself. Normalizing the reporting of sexual abuse to decrease the stigma. 
Reporting has to be the norm. And it's not just the idea of we need to report. Reporting is the first step to prevention. So as long as we can get females and males out into the world to report when these incidences happen, we can eventually stop them from happening or occurring on other victims. And last, if we talk, they talk. You have to have these uncomfortable conversations and they can't feel uncomfortable anymore. Those need to be the new norm. And advocating for your child is giving them the tool set to go out into the world and advocating for themselves, especially males, so that we can no longer have silent victims.